Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Mary Jean Holt, Wellness Manager at Hexpo Compounding, and welcome to our session number 11 of our nationwide Hexpo Wellness Program. Now today's program is kind of exciting. We are going to be looking at functional medicine, and this is part one of two. It ended up being a little too long, so I decided to just stop <laughs> and, and divide it into two sessions, and your review questions will actually be with part two, which will be next week. Okay, so let's get started. And we will begin as always with our wellness rule of five. So wellness rule of five, number one is lifestyle and willingness. Number two, mind, body, spirit. Number three, fueling our bodies. Number four, focusing on fitness. And number five, celebrating our wellness wins. So let's go back and I want you to see if you remember this particular slide. This is from the introduction presentation that I made uh, personally on every campus. It was an introduction to the wellness program. And whenever I'm making a public presentation on wellness and nutrition, I always include this idea that our society needs a new approach to health and wellness. And in, in that presentation, I gave us three reasons, and I'll just remind you of what they are. Uh, the first reason is because in the year 2000, the World Health Organization did a huge study in fact, they said, we're never going to do it again. It was so complicated, but I'm very grateful that they did this study in the year 2000. They rated the health status of all of the countries on the planet. At that time, there were 190 countries. In the United States, we spend more money than any other country, uh, and we rated, unfortunately, number 37. <laughs> so this is totally unacceptable to me. France and Italy were number one and two. We should be up there closer to the top, if not number one, based on how much money and energy we put into being healthy. Uh, but this is one reason that we need a new approach to health and wellness because what we're doing isn't working. The second reason, if you recall, was from a, a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1998. So it's an older study, but it's still true today, and I'm guessing the numbers have just gotten worse. What that particular study said was that for someone taking the correct drug for the correct diagnosis in the correct dose would still kill 106,000 Americans each year, making that the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. So, you know, it's really heartbreaking. Everybody's doing the right thing, but the drugs long term do cause problems and death is a potential problem from some of those drugs. So again, we need a new approach to health. <laughs> the third reason that I shared with you was a more recent study. It was published in, uh, let's see, it, the study referred to the year 2000. And this was also published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, stating the three leading causes of death in the United States. And the first was heart attacks or heart disease, which is still true. The second was cancer, which is still true. And the third was medical uh, treatment, so medical services. <laughs> so this again just shows us that our society needs a new approach to health. Our medical services should not be the third leading cause of death in our country. So we need to do something differently. So moving on from there, I want to introduce you to functional medicine. Now I've been aware of functional medicine and Dr. Jeffrey Bland, he is the father of functional medicine. I've known of Dr. Bland's work for many years since I was in chiropractic school and when I was studying nutrition and then certainly when I lived in the Pacific Northwest because that's where he lives. He is a mover and shaker in the world of nutrition and obviously he's the one that developed this whole idea of functional medicine. In the world of nutrition, it can be called functional nutrition. But in this way of looking at health, we're looking at how the body functions, not so much on what disease uh, is diagnosed, but specific individual uh, body function, and then how to uh, look at symptoms, how to do specific tests, and really determine what's the source of the problem. And as we heal the dysfunction in the physiology, we can actually heal the body and the symptoms go away. <laughs> so this is a patient-centered approach to health, looking at individual body physiology and function as opposed to what we're doing today, which is disease focus or disease-oriented, looking at the name of a disease and then prescribing drugs. 
So let's look more closely uh, at this. So functional medicine, I am saying, is an answer to our need for a new approach to health and wellness. And it's right here for us to take advantage of. So let's start with a brief review of our current medical approach. How did we get to where we are today? And it's because our current medical model is based upon the germ theory of disease. That in, in our medical model, we look at everything as being related to germs. Now, at, at some point that is true, particularly when we're looking at acute uh, illnesses and illnesses that are related to a certain uh, bacteria, uh, so an infection or a, a virus, that kind of thing. And this goes back to the introduction of antibiotics. So in the early 1900s, that's when scientists were starting to develop antibiotics, in the year of 1928, penicillin, which is the first real uh, antibiotic, uh, was discovered. And it was put into use mostly during World War II for our soldiers, for their infections and also for pneumonia. And then after World War II, so in the mid to late 1940s, the penicillin, uh, antibiotics became more widely available for use by the general public. Now we know that antibiotics have worked great and so many things that have been a problem have now been pretty much eliminated. What we have to be careful of now is not over utilizing antibiotics because we know that some of those bacteria will come back stronger and they are referred to as superbugs. So we're, we're warning people not to over utilize antibiotics, but they have been successful. And what I'm suggesting, because other people have suggested it also, that this was the beginning of what started our, our approach to health being like one specific agent to, to go against one microbe, or this might make more sense to you, a pill for every disease. We tend to have a mentality now that there's got to be a drug for every ailment. And we're finding that's just not true. That doesn't work. And so that's what I want to look at. And not only were they antibiotics, we can also look at vaccinations. So vaccinations uh, came into being, going after a certain uh, uh, agent, so um, uh, uh, antigen, and, and allowing the body to create antibodies to combat that antigen. But what we know is that it's chronic illness that is what most of us in our country are suffering from. And not just in our country anymore, it's more of a global thing because we've been leading the way. Um, and we're finding that that search for a single drug to affect a single cause, that is the problem. That's why our approach isn't working. And uh, let's look first at drugs. We know that even if you take a drug for a chronic illness, that drug does not heal the disease. It doesn't. What, what we're looking for at best is that the drugs for a chronic illness will hopefully manage the, the symptoms of the illness successfully. But what we've also learned, which we just looked at with the reasons of why we need a new approach to health, long-term use of drugs can also be det detrimental to our health and uh, can even, even cause death. So, so drugs are not the answer for chronic illness. They do not heal the illness. If anything, they may help to manage the symptoms of the illness, but long-term, they can cause problems, even death. The other thing I wanna mention, and this was new for me as far as the statistics here, so I wanna share this with y'all, that drugs are not effective for most people. And so here we have an, uh, a, a couple of quotes from Dr. Alan Roses. He's the former global vice president for GlaxoSmithKline, which is a huge corporation that uh, they manufacture various pharmaceutical drugs, uh, vaccinations, and other health-related uh, items. <laughs> but you know, they make a lot of pharmaceutical drugs. And so he's one of the really, really smart guys. He's the global vice president for this company. And what he's saying is that most prescription medicines do not work on most people who take them. And that for the vast majority of drugs, more than 90% of the drugs only work on 30 to 50% of the people. So even the large pharmaceutical folks, the large companies, um, those running the show know this, that, the, that drugs are not effective for everyone. 
And I will suggest uh, one of the things I love about nutrition, it introduced me to the concept of bio-individuality. That all of us are individual in how we metabolize things, not only our food and our nutrients, but also pharmaceuticals. And that would be one reason drugs don't work the same for everyone, but the other reason is that drugs are made to do certain things, but for some of these illnesses, the drug that is being produced for that particular illness is not addressing the actual cause of the illness. That's what I want to show you in more detail. But this is why MDs offer drugs as kind of a trial and error. You know, they'll say, take this. If it doesn't work, come back and we'll try something else. <laughs> it's a trial and error thing because not all of these dr drugs are going to work for everyone. So, big star here. A chronic disease is actually a group of symptoms that may be the result of a variety of different causes. So we put the, a disease name, uh, we give that to a certain group of symptoms. So let's take for example, if we have a patient coming in with certain complaints that include sadness, feeling hopeless, feeling a lack of interest in daily activities, a lack of interest in food, I don't want to eat, I don't really want to participate in the world, I just want to go to sleep and I'm just not interested in things that used to spark an interest in my life. What, what would that usual diagnosis be? You can probably guess. It would be, that person would be de uh, diagnosed with depression. And once we have a disease name given to these groups of symptoms, then there are a certain list of drugs that are uh, known to be associated as appropriate for that situation. Now when it comes to depression, usually what the medical doctor will do is prescribe an antidepressant, okay? So the antidepressant these days, here's some examples, Paxil, Lexapro, Prozac, many of these are called serotonin reuptake inhibitors, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Because someone just, it was a theory that a scientist put out, a researcher put out, that maybe people are so depressed these days because of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. That maybe that serotonin is being reabsorbed too quickly and maybe needs to stay circulating within the bloodstream longer so that we can feel happier for longer. And so all of these drugs now are being produced, particularly addressing serotonin. Now there are some others that have other uh, mechanisms as well, but what we find out, they don't always work. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that one of the big drugs that was being promoted was, I think it was called Abilify. And what the commercial said is if your antidepressant isn't working, don't change the antidepressant, just add this one on because this will make it work. <laughs> it used to drive me crazy. You know, if that drug doesn't work, don't stop taking it. Oh no, just add another one on. And of course it had a lot of serious side effects as well. That's why I didn't like this. So what, what I want to suggest, because it has been suggested by others, I'm just sharing this with you, that depression is not the actual cause of these symptoms. It's not the cause of their unhappiness, their sadness, their lack of interest. It's only a name that's been given to that particular group of symptoms. So we want to look, in order to help people, we want to look beyond just the name of the uh, symptoms or the name of the disease and look at the individual themselves and how their body is functioning. In functional nutrition and functional medicine, we're looking at the symptoms of, the, of whatever's going wrong as being a dysfunction in the physiology. And if we can address the physiology specifically for each individual, because it's gonna be individual for each person, and if we can uh, fix that dysfunction, then health should return. Because you know our body is made to be healthy. That's, that's what it does best. So the real cause of the patient's symptoms may vary a great deal from one patient to the next. So here's just an example of all of these things that can cause depression. This may surprise you. So number one, let's look at this, a gluten sensitivity. And you've probably heard of that. So gluten is a protein that is found uh, in wheat specifically. And gluten can cause a sensitivity, particularly when there's a condition uh, known as leaky gut syndrome. And leaky gut is also known as um, intestinal hyperpermeability. It just means that our small intestine because our digestive system isn't working, this is a symptom of poor digestion. The colon isn't moving its products out quickly enough, probably because of lack of 
fiber in the diet, uh, also uh, too much sugar in the diet causes the good bacteria to be killed off and so things start backing up. So if, if the, the large intestine, the colon isn't moving things out, the small intestine gets full and then we're still eating food so there's nowhere for the stomach to dump its context, contents in except into the small intestine and, and since it can't move things forward, the small intestine starts to expand and it gets these, these holes or little perforations so that the proteins that should be broken down into smaller particles of amino acids, uh, those proteins start leaking through the perforation, so leaky gut into the bloodstream, and now, which you might be able to guess, if we've got a protein molecule floating through the bloodstream and it's not supposed to be there, the body doesn't recognize it because it should be broken down into smaller pieces called amino acids. So what's gonna happen, we're gonna have an immune response. All these white blood cells come to attack that protein. And in doing so, they can also attack our healthy thyroid gland. Then our thyroid becomes ill and doesn't produce the uh, thyroid hormones that it should, and these can lead to depression and lower thyroid function. So that's a whole physiology dysfunction in itself that still causes the symptoms of depression. We could also have a B12 deficiency, and there's several reasons that could happen. One could be just a diet lacking in B12. If you are a vegan, you have to supplement with B12. Or you can have long-term use of antacids because of another problem, acid reflux. And I've, in Dyer's work, you know, I've told our associates many times, acid reflux is not a disease, it is a symptom of bad digestion, poor digestion. So that's another reason we can get to feeling down and depressed. Another possible possibility is a folate deficiency. Folate's one of the B vitamins, and that can be due to a specific gene here. We can also have a vitamin D deficiency, which is very, very common. Vitamin D is actually a hormone, and that can be due to lack of sunlight. The inactive form of vitamin D is in the skin. It has to have sunlight on the skin to cause the active form to be created. Vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. The uh, recommended daily allowance has gone up in the last few years because they found everybody with cancer had very, very low vitamin D. So another reason besides diet, some people just aren't getting out into the sunshine, they're covering up their body more, they're afraid of, of skin cancer, or they're lavishing on a lot of uh, 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 sunblock. But that stops the production of vitamin D. The other thing that can stop it are statin drugs because uh, cholesterol is uh, one of the building blocks of vitamin D. We can also have a mercury toxicity. Too much seafood uh, can be a problem. Mercury also is found in corn syrup, so high fructose corn syrup is, is now uh, the most common cause of mercury toxicity. And we'll talk more about this. You don't want to be eating high fructose corn syrup, and now that's become uh, a, a very popular replacer of sugar in processed food, another way to stay, a reason to stay away from processed food. Another very common thing, omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. Now omega-3 fatty acids, this is one of the supplements I think everyone should be supplementing with. Omega-3 fatty acids are an essential nutrient, that means you have to get it from your diet. It's very hard these days to get enough. Omega-3s are essential for brain function, for vision, keeping our cells and cell membrane healthy. It's just so, so important. So I recommend taking your uh, omega-3s. If you don't get enough omega-3s, you can certainly get depressed. So it can be uh, uh, diet-oriented or just lack of supplementation. There have also been several research studies looking at omega-3 supplementation for people with depression. And they rate as high and sometimes higher than the effectiveness of antidepressants. So this is something to really pay attention to. Also, we can have just a change in our gut flora. So you've heard about it, the microbiome. So again, sugary products kill the good bacteria in the gut. Also, we know that uh, antibiotic use kills the good bacteria. So if you have to go on a, a, a period of antibiotics, you need to intentionally reintroduce healthy bacteria back into your diet. Also, too much stress, anything that causes the inflammatory process can affect our gut because stress again, takes us uh, out of our digestive mode, which is a parasympathetic uh, function, parasympathetic nervous system, and into uh, sympathetic nervous system. So that can certainly stress by itself or trauma 
can cause changes in our gut flora. All of these things can cause depression, the same symptoms of depression. So it becomes very obvious that we need to look beyond the name of the disease. So clearly, just knowing the name of the disease does not tell us the cause of the symptoms. So this is why we will never find a single drug for a chronic disease. It is not going to happen. This whole thing with cancer, they're out to find a certain drug for cancer. There is never going to be a single drug to prevent or reverse cancer. Too many causes. And I think I've told y'all this, I've certainly talked about it in Darsburg a lot, cancer is a disease of too many free radicals. It, too much inflammation in the body. That's why we want to reduce cellular inflammation, not only to prevent heart disease and other chronic illnesses, but the more in inflammation we have going on, the more likely we are to develop cancer. So again, there cannot be a single drug for these chronic illnesses. And that is why our current approach is failing. So yay, now we have functional medicine, functional nutrition to come and save the day. So let's go back and look. If we are referring to our example patient who came in with these complaints of sadness and loss of interest in life and uh, that sort of thing, how will we find out the true cause of the symptoms? So this is how you do it. Now this is, I'm speaking from my experience in, uh, this is how I use nutrition in my work, um, which, you know, I don't do individual workups anymore, but I can tell you this is, this is how we do it. Number one, we ask a lot of questions. So we're going to start with looking at a symptom survey. So this is a list, of, it's just a questionnaire, several questions relating to the different organ systems of the body. Because a lot of times, so a patient will come in with certain primary complaints, but when they do the system survey, little smaller complaints will, will show up. And we're just looking for patterns. We're also going to do a biometric screening, just like we did with Empower for last year. And I love biometric screening because here's the difference. When we're looking at symptoms, symptoms are subjective. That means this is how I feel. But we can't really test a feeling that much, but we can test objective findings. So these are numbers. These are things that once we get these biometric tests, these lab tests, then we can uh, into, uh, initiate a treatment plan and then on down the line we can retest and so we can compare before and after is this process is our treatment plan working and then we can document that that uh, that progress and also when we're gathering information it's not just going to be the symptom survey we're going to get information about the patient's lifestyle you know a, a good example would be a diet history give me at least three days worth, if not a week's worth, of what you're eating every single day, because that's going to help. And then things about um, um, exercise, stress, all those different things. And once we get that information, we, we collect it, we review it, and we correlate it, and we come up with uh, potential reasons that are causing these symptoms, and more, more importantly, a treatment plan. That's what functional medicine is all about. Okay, so very, very simply, functional medicine is a personalized method for getting to the true cause of the symptoms and then restoring balance to the physiology. It is patient-centered versus a disease-centered disease approach. And I love that. We're looking individually at each patient. And then this is about creating a wellness lifestyle, but even more than that is about creating health. And what Dr. Furman would say is about optimizing our health potential. And get this, disease disappears as a side effect. It just disappears. It's going to clear up because we're going for the cause. We're not just giving drugs that are kind of masking the symptoms or managing things but aren't healing. We're, we're really going for the true cause so that we can heal the condition itself. No matter what the name of the disease is, we're going for the true cause and that the disease disappears as a side effect. Now I compare this to eating a whole foods plant-based diet and if you've got extra weight, it just falls off. It just goes away, just like magic. Same thing here, our, our, our uh, symptoms will just, will just tend to go away. Um, now, what I wanna remind everybody, you already know so much. We're, this is what, number session number 11. You know more than most Americans already know about how illness actually happens. You know the connection with inflammation. You know the connection with lifestyle and that it's not our genes. 
So remember, we've talked about this, put your knowledge into action. So if any of you are having symptoms in your daily living that make you uncomfortable in any way, no matter what disease you may or may not have been diagnosed with, where do we start? We look at the inflammatory process. You know the different things that cause inflammation. Go back and look at your list. You know, if you've got poor digestion, let's get that cleaned up. If you're not eating a healthy diet, whole foods, plant-based, let's clean that up. Uh, you've got extra weight around the midline, got to get rid of that. How do you do that? You just exercise a little bit. And you know, this, this extra weight around the midline, it's not so much working your abdominal muscles and doing crunches, just general aerobic exercise will tend to, to help with that. We want to keep our thoughts positive. Uh, what are the other things? Just staying away from chemicals as much as possible. That's why we want to get rid of the processed food, incorporate more and more of our uh, whole food. And at some point when we, because we're going to go back to talking about food very soon, I'm going to do part two of functional medicine. And then we'll uh, do more food and we'll also look at your um, uh, results from Empower from last year. I was hoping uh, to wait on that part until we're really getting our, our uh, courses, uh, our, our classes back. So I, I was trying to put that off until we can get back into it, so I know that everybody's uh, uh, up to date with our material. But here we, here we go, we just put what we know into action. We know that chronic inflammation is a part of every chronic illness. So before you even see a medical doctor, you've got tons of things that you can do on your own. Be proactive, okay? Look at your lifestyle, monitor your symptoms. If you're changing your diet, if you're working on your stress and all these things, expect the best, positive expectation. Align your mind, body, and spirit for success, okay? And this is an excellent beginning uh, for your self-care. Now, what I would like to do next week, I'm gonna follow up with part two, and we're gonna talk more about functional medicine and the cell, because it really does address uh, the cell versus um, genetic, uh, well, the cell and genetic expression, because it's the cell that determines which genes are being expressed. The cell is always reading its environment and telling the genes what to do. So we are not uh, victims of our genetic inheritance. Our lifestyle factors can change genetic expression. It's very, very exciting. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. And then we will also have our review questions for this session and for next week uh, in next week's uh, presentation, okay? So until then, I want you to choose wellness, realign your mind, body, and spirit for success as often during the day as necessary, and put what you already know into action. Okay, thank y'all so much. Have a great week and see you next week. Bye now.